Thank you. Um, thank you for the very nice introduction. Um, thank you for So, talking about photo matter interfaces like memories and interface, other things as an interface. I can put them on an arbitrary kind of scale from 0 Kelvin to room temperature. And there is a lot of advances in different labs, including our own lab, on cold atom memories. And uh, the advances are fantastic. But it doesn't look like cold data memories may become the platform for scalable uh, quantum information circuits simply because they have to evolve. Excellent achievements are also there for solid state memories, but in optics, solid state almost exclusively requires uh, 3 Kelvin or below. So it's large cryogenic setups. And what we've been doing for quite a while was a room temperature memory with the cesium gas of atoms. And this is what I will be discussing today. So arguing that the room temperature setups, if they can provide long memory times and short gate times, will actually may become the workhorse for the real networks. So how do we actually have how okay, you can eat it, how do we have the room temperature spins in a gas phase without them decohering in a split of a second? So we have our gases, and those gases are sort of trapped at room temperature, if you will, because there are special spin preserving coatings with which our cells with gases are coated, and those. Coatings provide absolutely incredible T2 times. So, to start with, we've been working for several years with coatings which provide T1 time of 0.2 seconds at room temperature, which is already very impressive. But in the recent years, we actually found new coatings which allow for the T1 time at room temperature up to 3 seconds. And then those coatings, when tested at Berkeley in a particularly good environment with large cells, they provide T2 time up to a minute for a gas at room temperature. So what else do you need for a minute unless you want to go for hours? 
An important statement is also that if you have the memory which is based on a large number of atoms, then you gain in two ways. One is that if you want to do use this memory as a sensor, then obviously the sensor's 10 quantum limit scales as 1 over square root of n. So the more atoms you have, in principle, the better you measure. And in terms of the light atoms interface, the comparativity parameter, which is pretty much the same as the interface efficiency, scales also with the square root of n. So having lots of atoms, if you can organize them in the right way, really helps. So this is what has been our workhorse for a few years. It's a cell coated from inside with this magic coating. And the atoms move around like that, but they are experiencing tens of thousands of collisions without the dephasing. And then what you do is you send light with the polarization as shown here. You may want to do some shaping before you send it. And you look in the forward scattered light in the orthogonal polarization. And I will show you a couple of level schemes where you will see that this forward scattered light actually is entangled with those atoms. And if you have entanglement, then you are kind of in the game of quantum interfaces. Now, what we should also emphasize here is that all those atoms contribute to this forward scattering in a non-distinguishable way. Which means that the entanglement is with the collective spin of this whole thing. So the atoms move around as they wish, but we are mapping the quantum state of those forward scattered photons on the collective state of all those atoms. And this is achieved by a few tricks. First of all, we're working off resonantly. So the excitation and forward scattering is kind of a round process. So we work off resonantly for the optical transition, which means that the Doppler broadening of atoms is irrelevant. And if the scale of the um, frequency splitting between the two levels which encode our qubit, if this scale is larger than the size of this cell, then atoms scatter forward in an indistinguishable fashion. And for our typical experiments, the frequency splitting here is certainly less than 10 gigahertz, which means that with, even with a few centimeter cell, you are okay, and with a few millimeter cell, you are certainly So the exponent which is responsible for the atomic position cancels out if the splitting of those two levels is smaller than 10 gigahertz for a cell of few centimeters. And uh, what we are actually doing as I speak here, we are going from those macroscopic cells to integrated microscopic cells and there is a list of advantages on the way from here to here. But before I go from here to here, let me just quickly summarize what we can do with such atomic memories based on our previous experiments with large cells. So, as I told you, the atomic ensemble is a collection of atoms, there is lots of them, we forget about the fact that they are traveling around because, as I said, this doesn't matter. And so I'm looking at the atoms which are optically pumped into one of the magnetic sublevels. And for the computer scientists in the audience, um, if you have a two-level system, in which case it's this two-level system, you can always represent it as a bit or rather as a cube because it's a spin one half particle and spin one half particle corresponds to a cube. And if you have 10 to the 12 of those particles and you orient them all in one direction, then you can put them on top of each other. And this is my macroscopic spin. And this macroscopic spin along the x-axis has two orthogonal components, z and y. And 
if this is a commutational relation, that means that there is a uncertainty relation. And so, if those atoms are independent and in the minimal uncertainty state, then this is what is corresponding to the shot noise with photons, and with atoms it's called the projection noise. So, the direction of this spin is only known to within this uncertainty, which goes in this quadrant of n, so the direction of the spin for uncorrelated atoms can only be given as good as 1 over square root of n. And I will tell you today about the implications that this statement has for sensing of magnetic forces, for instance. You would imagine that this will be the limiting factor for measuring magnetic forces. Turns out that it's not. And if you zoom into this part of the block sphere, then this is just your regular continuous variables x and p, which you know and love, and at the moment they are all encoded into the macroscopic and of course, since it's X and P, I can decompose them into the position, into the creation and annihilation operators. And what would this creation operator actually mean? Yeah, so those are some technical things. The creation operator means that if I scatter, for instance, one and only one photon in the forward direction, then I know that I have created the one and only collective excitation in my atomic memory. And that would correspond to the Wigner function of your usual Fock state with m equals to 1. So this would be a funny kind of state of your collective state. Um, a little bit more technicality for those who are not to atomic physics. Um, if I look at my atoms which are optically pumped into the extreme magnetic sublevel, those are some optical excited levels. So I shine polarized strong light like that, and the effects that I can have would be excitation with strong light and scattering of a quantum photon, or absorption of a quantum photon and continuing the process with the classical light. So this is what we call kind of a double Raman or four-way mixing or a butterfly interaction, which is your favorite name. And in principle, this process and this process, which are described by this part of the electronium and this one, they have different probabilities. So this one corresponds to creation of a photon and creation of the atomic state. It's a parametric Hamiltonian. It can generate entanglement. We know that. In this case, it generates entanglement between light and atoms. This process annihilates the photon and creates the atomic excitation. Here we go. This is a beam splitter interaction known from quantum optics. It should work well for quantum and finally, if you add both processes, then you have more or less the most general quadratic interaction that you can have in the system, and it can do interesting models. So you can rewrite this interaction through canonical variables, and in principle, you can achieve the situation where the second term vanishes, and then it's a quantum non-demolition interaction, which can be used as we have demonstrated, for instance, for entangling atoms in the atom clocks, or it can be used for precision measurements and so on. So, just to show you that, what, what does it mean to have, for instance, two atomic ensembles like that in an entangled state? In the two mold Einstein double sclerosis state, for instance. So here is one ensemble, and let's say that I've created excitation here. Here is another ensemble which is kind of inverted, and I can create an excitation here. If those excitations are correlated, there could be two excitations here, two excitations here, then they actually present you with the two mode squeeze state, or in other words, Einstein puddle sclerosis, which I can write here. For 
matrices like that. So it's a superposition of 0, 0, 1 here, 1 here, 2 here, 2 here, 3 here, 3 here. So that's kind of a visualization of the EPR entangled state in macroscopic atomic spin bodies. And it is interesting to note that this thing, hope you can see it, this is like an oscillator with a negative mass. I repeat, it's an oscillator with a negative mass. Why is that? Because the first excited state has the energy which is lower than the ground state. And this has profound implications for sensing. With an oscillator with a negative mass combined with an oscillator with a positive mass, you can in principle do measurements beyond standard quantum limit of forces and fields. And this is something that we have demonstrated last year for magnetic fields. So one more picture of the macroscopic entanglement of those two spins, now based on the EPR entanglement <coughs> condition. So the two bodies with x1, p1 and x2, p2 canonical variables are entangled if and only if this condition is supported. And this condition can be rewritten through the components of the spins of those two ensembles. And if this is fulfilled, if this is zero, for instance, on the right hand side, then those two large spins are exactly anti-parallel. So they are in a superposition of all possible anti-parallel directions. And this is the visualization of the macroscopic spin and tail. So, the statement is that for uncorrelated spins, each of those spins has an uncertainty of 1 over square root of n, angular uncertainty, this is used to quantum limit. If you make them entangled, each of them has a very large uncertainty, as usual. If you take one half of the entangled state, it's very noisy. But they are in the superposition of all possible parallel states. And already 11 years ago, we demonstrated that we can generate such a thing through a quantum measurement, and it will leave for 2 milliseconds. And a few months ago, we actually demonstrated that they can be entangled for as long as the electricity runs in the lab. So this is the entanglement generated by dissipation in a steady state. And the statement is that forever take. And the way we do it is we take those atomic spin ensembles, we send light through them, and we arrange it in such a way that forward scattered photons from this ensemble and this ensemble are indistinguishable. And when you have quantum systems with indistinguishable paths, it should lead to entanglement if you do it right. And this is kind of a nutshell explanation of what's going on here. A little bit inside the nutshell, we'll be looking in the Hamiltonians. Again, those two atomic ensembles pumped in the opposite directions. And I will go through that real quick. You have four scattering processes here, like that, like this, like that, and like this. They are described with this complex Hamiltonian, and if you trace over the uh, light fields here, then what you will have here, for those who had quantum optics course recently, you would recognize that those are the eigenstates of the EPR state. Those are the operators whose eigenstate is the EPR state. So this Hamiltonian should actually generate an entangled state just by running. Yeah, let me skip this. This is just what I said. So what you have is the no local Lindblad equation of the experts in the room. And this is the experiment.
experimental result. So what you see here is one this line corresponds to the borderline between not entangled above one and entangled below one. And this is time, and this is the beginning of the experiment. Those black dots show what happens with the entanglement if you just make it by measurement and step aside, it dies within a couple of milliseconds. If you keep running this experiment, then for 40 to 50 milliseconds, the two systems are entangled, which is obviously a significant improvement, but it's not infinite. And it's not infinite because our system is not perfect, and we can make it infinite if we add the measurement and feedback to the system. Yeah. Wonderful, but... So, again, without going into details, I can tell you simply the following. This is a very general statement, right? So imagine I have two objects and I want to generate them entangled by sending light through them. If I want them to be in a pure state, then the light which transfers through them should not be entangled with them. And therefore, it will have no information about those two. Life is hard, this process is not perfect, and therefore, what I get is kind of a mixed state. Therefore, light which passed through this system has information about those two. If I use this information by applying magnetic feedback on my atoms, I can improve the entanglement, and this is what we get. So if we use the information of the measurement, this is what we get. The state EPR variance go down, goes down below the then quantum Hagen by 30% and it stays there. So here it stays there for 25 milliseconds and it doesn't seem to go anywhere, but then this is the steady state entanglement which can be kept for hours at 37 degrees C if you like the human body temperature patterns. And this is to show you on the log scale now that we can also maintain this entanglement below this magic line for an hour, which is 10 to the 8 milliseconds. Okay? Another example of the glorious past is the back action free measurement on two magnetic oscillators, just to show you how the thing works. Imagine that I have my spin and what I show here is the projection of the top of this spin, right? So my spin is sitting on the block sphere. Here is the vector. This vector has its quantum uncertainty, and this is the quantum uncertainty that I showed. So this is the north pole, let's say, and this is the quantum uncertainty. And now I send light pulse through it, and in the level picture, what happens when I send light through it is this, right? So let's watch it again. <coughs> What this is, is the stock shift. And this stock shift is the quantum back action of light onto the atoms. It's unavoidable. But now let's take the second ensemble. So this is my quantum back action. This spin became noisier. Here is my other spin, which is pumped into the south pole. And the same pulse of light goes through this one. And what happens is that this one experiences exactly the same stochastic quantum noise. Therefore, this guy gets more noisy, but of course those two noises are anti-correlated. <coughs> and therefore, the measurement of the mutual direction of those two spins, right? So I had them like that, they became very noisy, but they became noisy in correlated fashion. Therefore, if I'm only interested in the measurement of the angle between those two, this kind of measurement does not affect this angle. And therefore, in principle, I can measure the magnetic disturbance, for instance, on the spin with the arbitrary accuracy. There is no standard quantum limit in this measurement. And uh, in fact, it's kind of funny because uh, Carl K. 
Caves, who is one of the founding fathers of the quantum measurement theory and stellar quantum limit. Since 82, he was saying that there is a stellar quantum limit in measurement of the force. And uh, a year and a half ago, he decided that there is no such thing. And then we talked to Carl about a few months before publication of this paper, but a couple of months after this paper appeared. And we agreed that what we actually observe in this paper is exactly the one of the implementations of his proposal. And so we have achieved in this paper the sensitivity to the magnetic field in the sub-femtotesla root hertz range, which is pretty close to what uh, Ramalis's group at Princeton has achieved, except for they've done it with 10,000 times more atoms because we are projection is limited and beyond and beyond. So our step stores integrated room temperature <coughs> sensors. Once again, we want to go from here to here. And uh, let me just see. So I have about 15, 17 minutes, I suppose. Uh, 18. 18. OK, then I can tell you this. So uh, just to, to show you what is, what is good about going to microcells from microcells. So the short statements are the following. What is very important is that the gate time or the control time or the interaction time is simply inversely proportional to the area of the cell cross-section. This is actually seen here and here. Why is that? Well, because it's the electric field that makes the interaction. And if you reduce the area by 10 to the 4, then you can have the same electric field with 10 to the 4 less photons, 10 to the 4 times less photons. Or, and, you can also reduce the time that this pulse takes. So instead of milliseconds that we are using with large cells, we can go to microseconds control gate time with microseconds. And we can reduce the number of photons. And we can use integration into cavities and fiber cluster. So this is our first baby steps on microcell manufacturing. So we take a glass substrate, we make a trench in it. This is about 100 to 200 microns, and this is a few millimeters. We put the silicon wafer on top of it. We bond them together. The silicon wafer has this tiny hole here through which cesium atoms and magic coatings enter. And at the same time, there is this funnel which allows you to efficiently pump out this system. You attach windows and you connect this thing. And that's what it looks like at the moment. And that's the cross section of the micro channel. And this is how those things are coated and filled. And this is what the cesium atoms in this micro channel look like. So I call it a room temperature dipole trap. It has a, a cross section of a couple of hundred microns, the length of a few millimeters, and uh, the coherence lifetime, which is at the moment two milliseconds. I think we can do that. So we measure the T2 times, and uh, we get the magneto-optical resonance width of 170 hertz, which basically corresponds to 2 milliseconds light. So in this system, we have a chance to have the gate time of maybe 10 microseconds and the lifetime of entanglement or whatnot approaching several milliseconds. 
So that's the ratio of the memory to the gate exceeding 100. That should allow you, in principle on paper, to build an efficient quantum repeater. Yeah. So this is the work in progress. And uh, now, to the last part of the talk. So I told you about those atomic memories. And now what we want to do is to incorporate in our systems mechanical sensors or you can call it mechanical memories. They actually can maintain their oscillations for seconds. And also LC circuits. So how do we use light to couple to mechanics and through, the, through mechanics to electronics? Well, coupling of light, oh, before I go further, yes, so remember I told you that one of our atomic ensembles can actually act as a mechanical oscillator with a negative mass. And we demonstrated that if we take two ensembles, one with a negative mass, one with a positive mass, we can entangle them and use them for measurements beyond the quantum limits. But now, how about we take the atomic ensemble with a negative mass and a normal oscillator. Then, according to this proposal that we published some time ago, we can actually entangle the atomic oscillator with the atomic oscillator with the mechanical oscillator and therefore perform measurements of the forces and acceleration beyond standard quantum limits. This is the Work which is very much in progress, and those two can be entangled by sending light through them, meaning that they don't have to be in the same room. Yeah, so what does the atomic spin ensemble have in common with the mechanical oscillator? Well, the Hamiltonians are the same. Uh, the optomechanical community now for a few years is blooming with those Hamiltonians. They take, for example, a membrane or a micro mirror, they couple it to the cavity field, and this oscillating mechanical object modulates light. So, light, which you put in, through this modulation at the mechanical frequency, it generates two sidebands, right and blue. Tuning this input light with respect to the cavity resonance, you can favor either the red sideband or the blue sideband. Now what happens if you generate a photon in the red sideband? Well, you moved a photon from the classical field into the red sideband. That means that the light energy is reduced. Well, that means that the mechanical oscillator got a single photon. So this is generation of a photon and generation of a phonon. So that's entanglement between a photon and a photon. If on the other hand, you tune your laser on the other side of the resonance, then you favor the blue photon which means that you are taking energy out of the mechanics and therefore it's a cooling Hamiltonian and people have demonstrated cooling to the ground state with this kind of Hamiltonian so this is all nice and good and in this position you can do quantum non demolition measurements and uh, we are we have a program working on that so this is our Solid cavity, basically this is a membrane, those are two mirrors, and the finesse of hundreds of thousands can be achieved with the mechanical Q of 10 to the 63 in our system. And this is the proposal that we are trying to implement at the moment, published a couple of months ago. And the proposal is the following. Imagine I have this membrane. This membrane can be efficiently coupled to light, but at the same time, 
it can be capacitive in the couple to the capacitor. It's a dielectric. When it moves, it can change the capacitance of a capacitor. This capacitor can be a part of the LC circuit. And if you can provide strong coupling between the LC and the mechanical motion, then with your light, which is a zero temperature device, you can read out electronic signals, you can even cool LC circuits. And do all the wonders that you are used to do with other systems with electronics possible. So you need strong coupling. Strong coupling in the sense that thermal fluctuations of this membrane at the peak amoeba scale should affect the capacitance in a reasonable fashion. And at the same time, thermal fluctuations in the LC through the field should affect the motion of this membrane in a reasonably strong way. And there is some theory behind it. You can do this theory, you can write Hamiltonians, you can linearize them, you get some familiar Hamiltonians. And uh, long story short, even long story shorter, even shorter. So this is where we want to put our capacitor with the inhomogeneous electric fields so that this dielectric moving in the field of this capacitor actually changes its capacitance, right? So if you have a homogeneous field and dielectric moves in it, the field doesn't change. If you have the inhomogeneous field and the dielectric moves in it, the field changes. So you need the fringe capacitor, kind of, this is plus minus, plus minus, what's called interdigitated capacitor. And then when the membrane moves, it changes the field, and when the field changes, the membrane is moving. And so this is the way to achieve strong coupling. And, uh, yeah, this is just to show you the first examples of our capacitors and the membrane on top. You can see the membrane because it's a 50 nanometer string with 10 to minus 5 absorption. But this is the close-up of the capacitor. And so again, cutting things short, let me just zoom into one interesting development. So, well, I don't know if I was the first one to say that, but the statement is, if you can add graphene to the story, just do it. <laughs> and uh, this is what <coughs> I call, this is certainly our invention. It's a silly graphene. Silic graphene is a single layer of graphene deposited on the silicon nitride membrane. And the beautiful stuff is that the mechanical cue of the silicon nitride membrane doesn't change. But what you get now is this graphene, which is which has huge dielectric permittivity, constant, and can even be a conductor. So with this kind of system, we achieved really impressive mechanical cues in several million range, and this is the first evidence of our way towards strong coupling. And uh, basically what you see here is the following. If I apply the DC field to here, and I measure the motion of this membrane along with its resonant frequencies. At this moment, I look at 811 kilohertz drum mode of this membrane, and now I apply the electric field, and the frequency of those thermal vibrations changes. And the first thing you want to think is, okay, so I have this membrane, I attract it with the field, so should the frequency grow or reduce? I would say it should grow because the tension is higher. Well, it doesn't. 
it goes down and it's actually easy to show that it should go down because it's in the nonlinear potential due to the uh, inhomogeneous molecular field. But long story short, it should go down and it should go down quadratically. And what you see here is the observation of the several picometers thermal oscillations of this membrane which really change, change the frequency very significantly. It's like, you know, more than a kilohertz for 40 volts of uh, voltage. And this at the same time is the displacement of this membrane, 3 nanometers with 70 volts. If you put all those things together, you can find out what is the ratio of the electromechanical coupling to the frequency. Sorry. And uh, what you get is that this ratio is like ridiculous. I don't even believe this. We need to repeat those experiments, but I think it's not far. And I think that with a reasonably low Q of LC, we can actually achieve strong coupling of optical field to electronics mediated by this mechanical story. So the summary is, I told you about the scalable, hopefully, certainly robust, definitely room temperature <coughs> atomic memory. It remains to be seen how good of quantum memory it is. The experiments are just starting with the microcell. And I also told you about the photon matter interfaces providing the options for sensing the scenario will have, well, what you buy at the shelf will have six microns diameter. As I just learned from my young colleague, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, there are in principle holocore fibers with 20 microns diameter, but nobody has seen whether they are supporting single mode or not. At the same time, if I, my, the lifetime of my memory is defined by the number of collisions atoms can withstand. And if I go from 200 microns to 6 or 20 microns, this lifetime will go down by a factor of 20, 50, 100. Maybe, in principle, this is a cleaner system to start with. This uh, standard quantum limit for the measurement of force, this is uh, uh, because I have not, maybe I missed something. This work by Carlton Kempf is related to the standard quantum limit, the measurement of position. Uh, is related to the standard quantum limit of the measurement of position. So you measure yes, the yes. force. Yes, yes, this is okay. exactly that. Okay. And the statement uh, that Carl made, actually, Roginski made this statement 20 years prior to that, but never mind. The statement is that if you want to measure the position, then there is a balance between the short noise of light that changes this position and the accuracy with which you measure. And this, of course, stands true. The trick here is that you don't measure the position and the momentum, you measure the difference between the two positions and the sum of two momentum. Okay, so anyway, the position is a relative. There is relative. no standard quantum limit. limit in there is no you. standard quantum right. limit if you use a reference oscillator. But this reference oscillator should have... So the standard quantum limit comes when you measure two posi uh, a position at two different times. The standard there is quantum limit bar. comes when you want to measure the position and then you want to measure... Yeah, position at two different, two different times. Precisely. Okay, which is the position in the momentum, for instance. Yeah, I would love to mention that it was UN who discovered that this derivation was flawed. 
Yes, and there is also a Japanese scientist by the name Ozawa. Uh, Ozawa? Ozawa. Exactly. And uh, there was a. So you are essentially uh, breaching the standard quantum limit by a new technique, which instead of squeezing, because in the case of UN, it was squeezing the position of the mass, which is something which is unfeasible, you are measuring, instead well, of measuring. Yes, but to, let, let, me, let, let me mention that there is a very particular difference. If you want to squeeze the position operator, which is possible, right. then if you want to measure the displacement, then you better know in which direction this displacement is going to act. Ah, sure. Because you are squeezing only but in one direction. Was no, a... excuse me, but yeah. this is very important. Because if you want to measure a small signal which comes in a microsecond, you don't know in which direction this signal will be applied in principle. If you do, fine, then you can do squeezing. This method, which mm -hmm. is a entanglement, doesn't require you to know the phase because you measure the whole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But in fact, the idea was not to squeeze the position, it was to prepare an in, in a state that was going to squeeze, uh, was a focusing state. Uh -huh. which is Contra contracting state. But there was no, no Hamiltonian that was able to do that. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. No, this Maybe is now you can do that. Now we can do it, exactly. <laughs> yeah, we are very happy. Happy kids. Okay. Well, if there are no further questions, let's thank. Uh,